right. Thank you, everybody, for coming out at the very, very end of the conference. Um, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm Hannah Taub. I'm a senior engineer on the Ethos cost efficiency team at Adobe. And this is the Node Tetris rabbit hole, why your bin packing and ours is underperforming. Quick intro to Ethos. Ethos is Adobe's internal Kubernetes platform as a service. We cover onboarding, deployment, integration testing, monitoring, everything in between. You know the drill. You've been here all week. We have different levels of guardrails for our different client needs, everywhere from just upload your container and we'll take care of the rest to almost unfettered access to the Kubernetes ecosystem. We are multi-cloud and multi-region across Azure, AWS, data center, and all over the world. We offer both shared and dedicated clusters for our different team needs. And all of this is across hundreds of clusters and thousands of nodes. It's big. Our background, the cost efficiency team on Ethos was, and it still somewhat is, a tiny team with the focus on cost efficiency. Started off with pretty much just me and my manager in 2020, and we slowly started beginning to grow over the past few years. And all of that was to deal with a huge problem space. We had to cover unallocated space. We had to cover cost monitoring. We had to cover client resource management. We had to cover everything else that falls under overhead spend reduction. And one of the paths we went down was improving our resource management by improving our bin packing. A few definitions just before I start for some of the specific terms I'm using. A client in this context is an Adobe internal namespace owner running pods in one of our managed Kubernetes clusters. Unallocated space is empty space on a Kubernetes node that's not reserved by any cluster resource, whether that's a client namespace or whether that's a daemon set or whether that's just the kernel. A pod disruption budget is a Kubernetes object that controls how many pods uh, with a certain label are allowed to be taken down by manual action at any time. This can be from cluster upgrades, this can be from nodes getting moved around, anything like that. Taints and tolerations are pod and node properties that make tainted nodes only schedule nodes, only schedule pods with the corresponding toleration. And pod anti-affinity and topology spread are two separate concepts, but in this particular context, they are covering a similar area that co they cover, there are pod specifications that control how many related pods can be scheduled onto the same node at one time. So, the problem, or the start of the rabbit hole. Here's what Kubernetes clusters should look like in an ideal world. We have nodes with a small and reasonably even amount of empty space, packed tightly and in, with good organization. There's some variation expected as nodes get upgraded, moved around, pods come up, pods come down. But overall, it's expected that unallocated will stay within an acceptable range. Maybe one or two nodes with extra empty space as pods are shuffled around. Here's what we were working with. We had shared cluster chaos. We had nodes that were more than half empty. We had an autoscaler that wasn't properly consolidating them. We had a scheduler that spun up new nodes instead of packing pods onto old ones. If we were just running one or two tiny clusters, maybe we could have dropped this further down the priority list. But as I've said, hundreds of clusters, thousands of nodes, this was becoming financially unsustainable. So we started investigating. Here's where we started. We knew the symptoms and we knew a few of the causes. We knew that we had low usage nodes. We knew that we had nodes that were imbalanced where CPU might've been very high, but memory usage was very low or the other way around. And we knew that we had unutilized resources that were being requested by clients and not getting used. 
we knew that a few of the causes, one of them were one of them was capacity focused autoscaling. The cluster autoscaler that ships with Kubernetes is focused on reliability. It's focused on capacity. It's not really focused on cost. Uh, we also knew that we had some clients that, as I mentioned, were over requesting resources. So we started rolling out a few different measures. These were platform pl problems. So we needed platform solutions. We started draining and rebalancing nodes by force. We looked for nodes that had less than, that had more than 30% discrepancy between CPU and memory, and we force drained them so that the scheduler could then place these pods onto better, better node types and in a more balanced fashion. We also started draining low usage nodes, looking for ones that had less than 30% usage and forced draining them again so that the scheduler could place them onto better nodes or especially existing ones. We started rolling out multi-tier node architecture where we had memory optimized nodes, CPU optimized, GPUs, spot instances, and we wanted the scheduler to be able to look at incoming workloads and place them onto the node type that best fit their resource usage. And we rolled out ARC. ARC stands for Automatic Resource Configuration. It observes an application's resource usage and sets its CPU and memory requests based on the 95th percentile of usage. So as you can see here, we've got two pods with with requests that got decreased and one pod at the bottom that actually got increased because it turned out that it wasn't requesting enough resources for what it was actually using. Well, we thought it was going well, but the thing is, a lot of these scaled down nodes would just pop right back up again due to topology spreads and anti-affinity anti -affinity configurations, meaning that these pods that we thought could get packed onto the same node, couldn't tolerate that. So they would not only pop back up again, but they would scale up em nearly empty nodes just to accommodate these scaled down pods. Some of our four strains were getting blocked altogether. We had pod disruption budgets that allowed few to no disruptions which meant that our four strains, especially when we drained multiple nodes at one time, would either error out or time out. Sometimes we even had PDBs that should have been healthy, but some or all of the pods were crashing, forcing the, po the PDB into an unhealthy state and making it undrainable. These blocked drains stopped most of the way through and created more low usage cordoned nodes that we call parked nodes. Again, driving up our empty space, not taking it down. And some of the node tiers that were lower usage were just running nearly empty. As an example, the memory optimized taint usually only had a couple pods on it at one time, and our spot instances, which again, were meant to save us money, also ran nearly empty and brought up nearly empty nodes for one or two pods, cost us extra instead of saving. So, Yikes. Here's where we landed after that. We knew that we had underutilized node types, spot instances, these certain tainted nodes. We were also starting to roll out cryo nodes that were underutilized. We, we were still dealing with uneven capacity focused auto scaling. All of our manual intervention for that just didn't really do the job. We knew that we had unhealthy clients missing images, crash looping pods that were breaking PDBs and forcing things into an undrainable state. And we had what we call bad neighbor clients. These are clients where their service was perfectly healthy. It passed all its health checks, it responded to requests, but, it, but these services caused problems for other clients on our shared clusters. They were, these were clients who were over requesting resources. These were clients with anti affinity configurations and pod topology spreads that reduced bin packing efficiency. These were blocking PDBs and these were abandoned services, services that were going weeks, months at a time without getting touched. So we knew that we had some platform problems and also we were starting to discover these 
client-based bad neighbor issues. So we thought, you know, client problems need platform solutions. We tried a couple things. We started mutating blocking pod disruption budgets. We looked for ones with this disruptions allowed equals zero or PDBs in an undrainable state. If there were no healthy pods, so everything is in crash loop back off or some other failure state, we just scale down the whole thing. Nobody's using it anyway. And we'd mutate the PDB to allow 10% disruptions for when it came back up. If there were some healthy pods and it was one of our certain platform managed services, such as our namespace monitoring service, we'd add up to 10% allowed disruptions. We also started scaling down broken and abandoned services. As I mentioned, if all the pods were in crash loop back off, kill it, nobody's using it anyway. We also started scaling down stage services that had zero traffic for at least a month. Again, we thought it was going great. Not so much. See, here's the problem. Before, we were making platform changes that mostly went unnoticed by our clients. We were working in the background, being pretty invisible. But when we started actually touching people's services, the volcano started erupting a little bit. We started off with straight up denial. You're not allowed to change this. Anger. We never had to do this before. We never would have migrated to your platform if we knew this was a requirement. Bargaining. We're swamped and we just don't have the, the cycles to make and accommodate these changes. And we started realizing we're creating a bad experience for our users. That's not what a platform is supposed to do. That's not what we set out to do. And so we oops, hit that twice. So we had a decision to make. Do we force these changes through, changing our current users' experience out from under them and demand acceptance? Or do we pull back, reassess, try something else? Ultimately, we decided to reassess and go back to the drawing board. Here's where we are today. We are rolling out Carpenter, which we are super excited about. Being able to scale with cost as a node selection criteria instead of just uh, capacity has been amazing. We're already seeing huge savings from it and better bin packing. We found an issue, not really an issue, more an oversight, honestly. The default value of max pods that ships with Kubernetes doesn't always cover all of the space in modern node types. We have some clusters that have many, many, many tiny pods, and these clusters were being weirdly underutilized. And we started realizing that that was because we had left max pods at its original value and never re-examined it. So we started slowly testing out, increasing it, can the control plane handle all of these extra pods per node? So far, it's going great, and we're seeing huge savings already. And on the, on the client side of things, we're working on client education initiatives. We want to start teaching our clients how to be good neighbors on shared clusters. We're also looking into ways to monitor and expose these undesired application behaviors, such as blocking PDBs, um, and to clients and maintainers. Because again, we have clients who have intentionally built their services around these behaviors and they, we, they rely on them, but we also want to inform them of what these behaviors are doing to the rest of their shared clusters, because they might just not know. And we're discussing the best way to handle client config policy changes in a way that won't create an experience like that for our users again. What's the best way to roll out these restrictions? What do we do with the clients who rely on this bad neighbor behavior? If you have a workload that is truly undisruptible, how do you accommodate that on a shared cluster? And here's where we are today. Underused node types, we've pretty much got that one taken care of. Spot instances and these underused tainted nodes have been mostly, mm, mostly moved out of usage. 
And everything on our clients, on our clusters is using Cryo now today. So those are no longer underutilized, they're just utilized. We're rolling out Carpenter and MaxPods increases to, uh, better, to better accommodate our auto scaling, to increase our bin packing efficiency. We're still, we're working on the best way to balance client experience with efficiency when it comes to client behavior. So we're still discussing client education initiatives, uh, monitoring all of this behavior, all of that. And ARC is doing great with over-requested resources. Obviously, there are always changes that we want to make and new things are being rolled out into the Kubernetes ecosystem every day with things like VPAs, but ARC's been doing a great job. We're really pleased with it. So where did we land after the rabbit hole? And what did we learn? It's much easier to build an efficient platform from the ground up than to make it efficient later. We, folk, we really wanted ethos to be reliable. We wanted stability for our clients. And trying to introduce efficiency concepts into it after the fact, after our clients had already gotten used to how our platform behaved, meant that we got a lot of pushback and we ended up paying for resources that we might not have needed. Cluster behaviors are more intertwined than is always apparent. Fixing one problem may reveal or even cause two others. When we tried scaling down underutilized nodes, we, didn't re we thought that the problem was just the, the scheduler. We didn't realize that the actual problem was PDBs and topology spreads. Different tools can run headfirst into each other and cause these issues. Also, when you get the chance, revisit your existing configs and figure out if any old approaches that may have been necessary when you first started using Kubernetes are now less necessary. And finally, stability goes beyond single application health. A healthy namespace may still cause problems for other applications if they share the same cluster space. And scale brings chaos. The wider your scope is, the more you're going to have to handle. The more freedom you give your clients, the more you rely on them to know how your platform works. Make sure they do. Because regardless of what you promise in your contract and what you expect your clients to do, all observable behaviors of your system will be depended on by somebody, whether you want them to be or not. And finally, if you have a big, thorny, seemingly unsolvable problem, don't be afraid to take a few sprints and go down the rabbit hole. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I didn't leave the QR code on my slides, but if anybody has any feedback, uh, I would love it if you went into the uh, schedule and just left me some feedback. And if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. I finished a bit early, so we have time. Uh, so you spoke about CPU and memory, but with bin packing, like Kubernetes doesn't do a great job with network and disk. So do you all restrict those resources? Um, sorry, could you repeat the, could uh, you repeat that? Do you like have a way to segregate network and disk for pods as you're bin packing them? Uh, so, no, uh, not exactly. Our bin packing efforts mostly focused on CPU and memory. Um, networking, uh, we have started looking into better network efficiency, but most of our bin packing efforts focused on CPU and memory. And I guess your clients might be writing applications in various programming languages, right? Mm -hmm. So. With C groups, what I've realized is that not all programming languages respect C group limits, and maybe some do a better job than the others. So you need to like actually enforce that. So do you do something in your configuration to like set environment variables, or like how how, how does that interaction work? For example, 
Go, you need to use Go Max Prox and Go Mem Limit. And so when I talk about uh, Arc setting requests, Arc doesn't touch limits. Um, Arc only modifies requests. And we don't even set limits for some of our applications because of exactly what you're saying. Um, there are some applications that will burst far beyond the capacity that they're all allocated. Um, so we, we don't handle, we don't set uh, requests or limits differently based on what programming language an application is written in. And just because we kind of want to keep our platform unaware of that, we want people to be up, able to upload a container and the platform doesn't care what it's written in, it just runs it. Hi, so you briefly brought up the use of uh, Carpenter in your slides. I'm wondering if you all uh, maybe perhaps have considered like the usage of like node pools and like basically dedicating a node pool per, uh, uh, I don't know, billing team or, or whatever you would like to call it and then just like shifting the cost of, or the onus of cost on application teams themselves. Uh, so we do have a pretty extensive chargeback system set up already, and that's been in place since long before we started rolling out Carpenter. Um, so we do use node pools, but they don't necessarily factor into our chargeback. Okay, thank you. At the beginning of the talk, I think you mentioned um, running clusters in a mix of cloud environments as well as some on-prem environments. Um, a lot of the like auto scaling and, and been packing applies really, really well to cloud environments. How, how does um, how does handling those on-prem environments change your strategy? Honestly, uh, most of our work has been for cloud environments, just because on-prem is so different and auto scaling. A lot of our auto scaling tools are designed more for the cloud. So the answer is just not as much. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so we recently also encountered these kind of problems and we also enrolled Car Carpenter, uh, but our workload is mainly consists of batch processing. I'm, I'm so sorry, I can't hear you. Could you step a little closer to the mic? Yeah, uh, now it's better? Yes, thank you. So I said recently we have enrolled Carpenter as well because of uh, similar issues, uh, but our workload mainly consists of uh, uh, batch processing. So. Uh, this still uh, presents an issue because we can't disrupt it as much, and also uh, we can't, when you put high, node high pod counts in the nodes, it's, it's make disruption even more destructive. So mm -hmm. do you have any advice to this kind of workload? Um, honestly, that's one of the things we're still working on because although unbreakable PDBs are kind of the biggest face of undisruptable workloads, they're not the only version of it. Um, and it really depends. Uh, there are some clients where if they have batch processes, they do better in uh, dedicated clusters. Um, and for shared clusters, uh, we have something called the shredder, where if a node has been parked, like I mentioned, uh, partially drained and cordoned, um, it's given a timeout. So that pod then gets to sit on that node for up to a certain amount of time, depending on what kind of cluster it is. Prod gets more time, stage gets less time. So it's given a more graceful termination period um, while nothing else is scheduled on it, and the, and the shredder checks in and takes it down after that time period. Uh, first of all, you know, great presentation style. Um, Thank you. But I also wanted to know a little bit more about um, what would you, what do you do, or what do you suggest doing for uh, non-EKS um, clouds, right? So I'm not sure if your workloads are split across, you know, Google or Azure, but Carpenter is, uh, as I understand, pretty AWS specific. So I was just curious, you know, what, like, what other solutions you would have for other uh, clouds, if if you do. I believe Carpenter is being rolled out for Azure soon. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, 
and we don't run in Google, unfortunately. Okay. So uh, it's really just those two for us. That's fair. Um, and in terms of uh, like client education, um, what do you, what would you recommend for like in terms of specifics? There is it just making better documentation and sort of presenting mm -hmm. that to them? Is it you know hosting? Um, you know, like, like I this. said, uh, we are having a lot of discussions about that. We actually talked about that just at lunch earlier today, my team and I. Uh, and so we've been throwing out a bunch of ideas of uh, making regular blog posts, um, having a playlist of brown bags where we dive into various parts of our environment and how it works, um, maybe coming up with, like I said, that dashboard that the idea behind the dashboard would be not just that it exposes these uh, bad neighbor behaviors, but also that it would link to solutions for how for alternatives to them, um, and also maybe explanations as to this is why your cost is going up. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. It was great. Um, we have a problem where we run Java, and that means that at container startup, they start using as much as CPU as they're pretty much allowed to want to two cores. But as soon as that stops, uh, normal traffic will probably use somewhere like half of that, let's say 50, 500 milli cores. Um, have you run into similar issues and how have you been dealing with it? And basically, which means unused resources because when you deploy, you want them to all start up mm -hmm. reasonably quick. So the cool thing about Arc is that it doesn't just modify resources on startup. It, modify, it is constantly examining uh, resource usage for a pod and on a seven-day rolling basis, I believe. Uh, I have my coworker, or some of my coworkers who wrote the thing in my front row. Uh, so it's, like I said, it examines the 95th percentile and is constantly uh, monitoring and updating the requests based on that seven-day rolling window of usage. Right. Uh, when, when you're starting to make the re uh, request change, that mm -hmm. reboots the pod, right? The request, the, the change ah, to Ah, yeah, resources. I see what you mean. Oh, that's a good, that's a good point. CPU hmm. limits won't help because if the pod doesn't get enough CPU, it won't. Mm -hmm. No, no, yeah, re it removes them, but you're still over-provisioning the node mm -hmm. because it needs the, the resources to start up. So if it doesn't start up fast enough, then readiness probes fail, and then our services mm -hmm. are down. That's our... Honestly, that's a really good question. So a lot of our Java applications that have this problem, we just rely on that virtual state, which is not a great solution. It's not guaranteed Yes. yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's exactly our problem. Okay. Yeah, Thank unfortunately, uh, our. Hmm? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, a lot of our clients were able to just get around this by using our previous not as good bin packing to grab all of that extra space. So it was a bit of an invisible problem up until recently. Thank you very much. Hi, Scott Grimes uh, with DRW. Uh, we have basically the exact same problems that you guys do. Uh, we've gone Exciting. down the same rabbit holes. Uh, we've got dashboards. We've done customer education. Um, I'm very curious what your chargeback model is, because I found that that is really the only thing that like puts a fire under people's butts to mm -hmm. you know, actually go and, and make changes to uh, what those request limits are or implement some sort of system where it can scale automatically. Um, do you do like a straight utilization chargeback? Do you charge like uh, extra amounts based on like reserved but unconsumed resources? So um, it's, talk a little bit about that? it's straight up based on resource reservation, um, not just for CPU and memory, but also for network usage, for storage usage. Um, and it's very much based on reservation because that's the space that they take up in the cluster. If they want to pay for less, then they need to reserve less and figure out how to deal with that. So it's not, it's not utilization, it's Correct. requests. So it's sort of like, you can pay for the whole hamburger, you don't have to eat it, but you're still exactly pay, pay for the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, great questions, everyone. Uh, any other questions? 
Got one. Hi. Uh, one more from me. Sure. Um, you said that uh, sometimes you decide uh, that some workloads need to stay on dedicated clusters, right? Uh, how do you decide that? How do you move the workloads? Um, so when I say that some workloads are better, that's not really a decision that our team makes. That's usually a decision that we come to with after discussion between the infrastructure team and the team that wants to run on the cluster. Because it's not just, um, there are a lot of factors that go into deciding whether somebody runs on de a dedicated environment or not. It's also to do with maintenance. It's to do with their own cost profile. It's to do with the type of workload. Um, and we have some clients who run massive applications on our shared clusters because that's still the best environment for them. And we have clients who run pretty small applications in dedicated clusters because they absolutely need their own space. So it really varies. Whether maybe they have massive networking needs. Maybe they uh, absolutely cannot have any other pods running on their nodes at all. Maybe it's that's for security reasons. Uh, it's really a decision that we come to with each individual team. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Oh, one question. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, so two, or actually two questions. So if I'll start with the first question. Um, in terms of uh, Carpenter using spot versus on-demand, and how do, you, how do you categorize what we're close to be running on spot versus on-demand? So we basically don't use spot anymore. OK. That answers the question. Yeah. Um, uh, we had so few people using it that it was ending up costing us more just to bring up spot instances than to just put the workloads onto shared nodes anyway. Got it. A second question is on pod destruction budgets. Mm -hmm. So you, I saw in the slide that um, you would set if a specific workload is running, it doesn't have a pod destruction budget set, you would set to be like 10% based off your... So it's not that we put PDBs onto applications that didn't have them. It's that. Uh, for specific managed applica applications that we, the platform, manage, uh, we would move them from zero disruptions allowed to 10%. Okay, what about a service team doesn't have a pod destruction budget? It's, a, it's this abstraction tier as a platform team that we have to provide to service teams, but do you have something that analyz analyzes on the workloads and decides what kind of pod destruction budget to be set for this workload? Um, so, if a service does not have a pod disruption budget, then they are allowed to do that. We do not encourage them to do that because PDBs are an extremely valuable tool when used correctly, but they are allowed to if they so choose. We do not enforce that for them. Um, but in a state cluster, how do you manage the reliability of a service running when you have maintenance going on? Um, Oh, uh, I am being told that I have two minutes left, so this is the last question. Uh, generally, uh, we tell them to put a PDB on their application. We do not enforce that for them, but if they don't have it, then that's their choice to make their application more fragile. Thanks. All right. Uh, if it is very quick, I think I can yeah. do one last question. Very quick. Um, is Arc open source? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll think about it. Great. Thank you.